at Wilson College and um, going to the faculty. And I guess some of you may have um, given up the barbecue this afternoon, and, so it's, and instead you come to choose uh, to enjoy the spiritual intellectual barbecue here. And um, and met, uh, to the talk given by Professor um, Baron Teha. Um, and Confucian, um, Confucius has been deeply uh, influential in China uh, for over about 2,500 2, years. And his teaching has been an essential component of the Chinese culture. And um, not only it is important to Chinese society, but it is also um, of universal value. Uh, Confucianism, actually, um, it is a debate whether it's a philosophy or religion. So this afternoon, it's an honor to have Professor um, Baron Teha to give uh, this very important talk here at Queen's College. And Professor Teha is um, a leading authority um, on this current issue, but also he has taught actually on Chinese studies, extensive and variety of topics. And uh, he is a cultural and, and social um, historian. Uh, previously, he was um, chair of the Chinese studies at Leiden University. Right now, he is Ron Wen Shaw, professor of Chinese studies at the Institute of Chinese um, Studies here in University of Oxford. Yes, warmly welcome, Professor Baron Tafak. It would have been nice if we had uh, been behind me going, but no one here knows how to work it, so we'll do it by heart. Uh, it would have been nice for one reason, at least, that's, I always give too much information and then it's nice if you can see behind my back while I talk. And it would have been nice for my Chinese colleagues, whose English is not as good as my Chinese, <laughs> <laughs> which is actually very bad, <laughs> sorry for that. Um, but I'll speak in English. If you have questions uh, in Chinese, we uh, can manage later on. Uh, we maybe have some debate clarification. Uh, if I were to give this talk in Chinese, it would be a very different talk, of course, because the word Confucianism actually is not used a lot in China, so the issues would be very different. Uh, I've already changed the name of the talk, and I'll probably change it again after the talk. So I used to call it Invention of Confucianism from a religion to philosophy. I think it's better to say from religion to philosophy. Now, my, this is actually not a talk I a talk I ever wanted to give, because when I grew up sinologically, so that's since 1976, maybe even older, uh, I always hated Confucianism, whatever it was, I didn't really know. But I hated it because I thought it stands for everything that's bad in China. And that's not made for thinking, that's actually because we had to read the Sushu with the commentary by Tushi. So we had to read the four books of the commentary by Tushi. And each time we read the commentary, now each time we read the original, in this case the Mencius, thought, well, that's nice. It's not very hard to read, to your classical Chinese. So we would read the commentary by Tushi. And it didn't make any sense, because Tushi makes these texts, maybe no light is better. <laughs> <laughs> I have enough light of myself. Uh, but uh, Tushi makes something totally different of it. Now, Many decades later, I know what is happening, and I'm more tolerant of what Tushi did, or tried to do, uh, and more interested in it as well. But nonetheless, I never was very much interested in Confucianism. I'm a scholar of local Chinese religious culture. And the other thing I never liked, but about which I will talk today, is Western missionaries. Because to me, Western missionaries, especially since the 19th century, have destroyed, or have been responsible for destroying, together with the communists, a lot of the stuff that I study, local religious, Chinese religious culture. So I have very little love lost for people like James Lager, who is my great, 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 great predecessor, and many others, because they are part of that movement that destroyed the stuff that I study. Nonetheless, uh, I also developed an interest in the history of our field, uh, my field, not necessarily always your field, which is Sinology in Europe, so the European way in my case, the Dutch way of looking at Chinese history, which meant uh, understanding the roots of Dutch synodity, which is basically control, colonial control over local Chinese from the south of China, Zhangzhou, Xiamen, that region. And they actually also, like me, were not very much interested in Confucianism, whatever it is, uh, because they didn't encounter it. You don't have much obvious Confucianism in any definition. In the Dutch Indies or in the southern China. And so to them it was not very relevant. But then I came here 
changed my life, uh, or it will change my life once I'm here long enough, I'm sure. And one of the things I started to get an interest in more or less professionally is the history of Sinology, Chinese studies in Oxford. Well, it sucks, it's not very great. But one of the people we can be proud of in a way is James Lager, yeah, because he started to translate. We can be proud of him. He, he produced translations that we still use. On the other hand, he was very myopic. And the China that he saw was a very small China. I mean, basically Hong Kong, that's the China that he knew. Nothing against Hong Kong. I love Hong Kong. But it's just a small part of China. And certainly those days, it was not uh, in the late 19th or middle of the 19th century, Hong Kong was just a small fishing harbor town where they smuggled the ocean and more of that sort of thing. It's not really representative of China. So James Lang's view of China was very limited. But there are others. So I thought, okay, let's see how these Westerners, 19th century Westerners, looked at China, and was it all wrong that they did? If you are a proper scholar, you have to leave your prejudices behind. In this case, mysteries are all bad, and see whether there is some work for what they've done after all. And it turns out there is a lot of work, not just because they shape our field, but they actually, I think that will be my argument at the end of this day's lecture, they actually saw more than we do today because they saw a more or less complete traditional China in which religious culture, which is really in everything in traditional China, that was still there. It's a China we can no longer see. We can only try to reconstruct it from texts, but when you reconstruct something from texts, you are heavily influenced by, by what other text persons, us, people like us, want to see and wanted to see in the past. And I can tell you, and maybe you know already, that people who are into texts have a lot that they don't see because they sit here today instead of watching the finals of the hockey world championship in The Hague, which I should have done, uh, finals between the Dutch team and Australia. They have started, I think, just now. It's much more interesting. That's life, right? But we sit here and we talk about something that is in many ways long dead. Not irrelevant, but in many ways, not all, but in many ways long dead. And that's typical, of course, of text people. But they are not always au courant. They don't know what is happening in the culture around them. So they have a limited view. It's okay. I'm part of that, but they have a limited view. But I discovered that, for me it was a discovery, maybe not for you, that these 20th century missionaries, in this case mostly English speaking, English writing from here, from the United Kingdom, maybe soon not from the United Kingdom, James Lager, for instance, was a Scot, or from the United States, just as it. But they saw something that was alive. They lived in China when doing their work. And that will be a very relevant point for two reasons. One, while they lived in China, they did not have access to what the Jesuits wrote about China, because they did not have big libraries in China. They didn't carry the Jesuit collections, yeah, huge collections in themselves, back or to China in order to consult them. They, they were actually there in Shanghai, but they couldn't access them. So they were not open with what the Jesuits wrote, had written before 1800. They didn't do field work, but at least they lived in China. They knew yeah, China in a relevant way, because some of them at least, not James Lager, but Joseph Atkins, Justice Dooley, uh, one of my other predecessors in Leiden, GGM, Jan Maria the Groot, the Groot, you may say, of, of but this much of books on Chinese religious culture in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. These people lived in China for a long time. They may have had prejudices, but they at least talked in Chinese, whereas the early 20th century Sinologists in Europe did not. So it is an important fact that they were out of touch with the Jesuit view of China, and they were in touch, however prejudiced, with living Chinese culture. Even Joseph Atkins actually talked to Buddhist monks, monks. GTM the Groot, the Groot, in your pronunciation, he's the first Sinologist who ever did field work. He's not a mystery. He's the first ever to do field work. He did field work for a total of six years. There are very few Western anthropologists today who do that much field work. And he, did, he lived in a monastery for a number of months and so on. So these people actually spent some time and effort on getting to know their culture. Of course, in, the, in a way they were still blind, but then so were Chinese observers that we use for understanding China, the literati. There's a lot that the literati didn't see either. Now, the first thing you do, that's what I tell my students, it's not really true, the first thing you really do is you read primary sources, then you get some questions, 
and then you check the secondary literature. The main book on the issue of what Confucianism is, or when it was created, is a book by a guy called Lionel Jensen, he's a Duke, was a Duke person, Manufacturing Confucianism. But if you read that book, well, if you read that book, you will think, wow, that's a great book. It got a prize, maybe several prizes, I don't know, it was one prize in 1994, so it was really very much appreciated. And then there is this book review by a friend of mine, a Jesuit, Nicholas Standard. If you ever want to know about Christmas in China, pay attention to that name. He is the expert in the standard, standard, maybe the way you pronounce it. And he published it in a very strange, out of the way journal, but you can simply find it on the internet. The Google standard, S T A N D A E R T, is in your hand up. And it's Christianity, and you will find it. He shreds the book. He shreds it, but certainly. Not everybody noticed it, so it was still influential. But he points out that whereas Jensen suggests that the Jesuits manufactured Confucianism, actually they never ever used the term. Well, that's it. Right? I mean, if they didn't use the term Confucianism, obviously they didn't create it. And um, they have the word Confucius, but not Confucianism, not the religion of Confucius. They talk about other stuff. So, what Standard does not answer is when does this term then come to be? Some suggestions. I followed them up. For one thing, I tried to find the term. Well, I'm jumping now. That's what happens when you don't have a PowerPoint. He tries to find the term in Jesuit sources, later 18th century Jesuit sources. He doesn't find it. So I thought, okay, that's a nice little project. Well, let's try and find out when the term came to be basically this lecture. The other thing you do is try to find some definitions. What is Confucianism? And it's very frustrating, but actually very common phenomenon in many fields, including my own Chinese study. Nobody defines Confucianism. Not really. Then the best you will find in 20th century research is that it's sort of based on the analects, the learning by Confucius, including Mencius, which usually excludes Jews for some reason. Um, but actually, there are not many good definitions. So you go to the Chinese term. Most of you will that know that term maybe better. Wu Jia. R U G E I A O. It's difficult to spell in foreign language, sorry. Wu Jia. Um, the Chinese do ha don't have the term Confucianism. Well, nowadays they could, but not traditionally. They have the term Wu Bo Da. But then, of course, from the perspective of Westerners, Jesuits, and so on, the question is, what does Rupert mean? And then, how do we translate it? Well, the usual solution of sinologists, if they don't understand the term or don't know how to translate it, is they don't translate it. Yeah? So they, that's Taoist. It's a very good example. You just don't translate. And it's a very stupid way of calling them, because the Neo-Confucians of the 12th century also call themselves Taoists. Tao Xue, right? study of the Tao, and uh, pharmacy, so traveling uh, salesmen of recipes, of uh, pharmaceutical recipes, medicines, who call themselves Tao then, people of the way, lay Buddhists of the 12th century, but also of the 18th century might call themselves Tao then, people of the way as well. So the way, Wayism, Taoism is a very unclear term to refer to a religion, and Buddhism is not much better, but at least that some relationship that's unique to Buddha and those who go Buddhism. And then Wu, you could call it Wuism, it has been done. Wuism would have been the solution, that would not have explained anything, yeah, but at least it would have been a, a term. The problems they face is, and it starts with the Jesuits when they encounter this word Wu or Da, or Wu, or Wu, or Da, or Sanjiao, the three teachings, is there is no clear opinion among the Chinese, communist opinion, shared opinion among the Chinese, what it is. There is not a dictionary, like the Oxford Dictionary, where you can look up what Wu means. And you have to deduce it from the way the term is used. The Jesuits basically translate it as the philosophy of the literati. Then the problem is, we have experts here, so I'm very hesitant to define philosophy. But I think philosophy to the Jesuits was not necessarily what philosophy is to us. I think philosophy to them is probably closer to theology than it would be to the secular 
the loss of people, how they affect each other later. So the modern solution has been to call them Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism, rule Confucianism, or Buddhism, and Tao. Taoism. Actually, that's very modern, late 19th, 20th century. Yeah, these terms were usually trans transliterated, kept, or they had other ways of dealing with it. I mean, they, these are actually quite modern terms. And then these modern terms, let's say 20, this 20, 21st century understanding of what Confucius puts in house, this is then projected back as hard fact in the past. And, and that's again very common in certain Chinese studies. There is no historical research in how these semantic fields, who call Tao, change, not just between, let's say, the 60th century or 70th century when the Jesuits came, but between every century, because actually these words mean different things in different periods. They are not even the same today, even though in the past. There's only one exception which you'll find in the handout. So, it puts better on the PowerPoint. I am in trouble. I hope you recognize me. This is what the high students did that when I left Leiden. They disguised Confucius as me. Because there was a rubric in the student newspaper that was Tian uh, Hai Yue, Tian Si Yue, Master Tian, that's me says, and then there will be some silly quotation from my lectures. So I'm in trouble, because actually I'm using words that are not defined by the people I study. I find myself difficult to study that are not really defined by the people we study, not defined by the people who have studied this, not defined by the people who are being studied. Really a complete mess. And it's very striking, you read a book on a very famous Chinese novelist, the scholars William Weissman. And you would think, and the book is called After Wu, let's say Confucius, you would think that at one point or another the secondary study would study what Confucian or Wu means. Not the case. They just use the word as if we know what it means. So it's a very messy field. And there's complete good trouble because terms like religion, philosophy are as unclear as well. I'll give that to my PowerPoint. So there are several options several ways of dealing with such a problem where nobody defines the terms that we nobody defines the phenomenon. One is to start defining, obviously. Right? Some people do that. Uh, I think in the 20th century what most scholars who want to use the term Confucianism have done when they define it in the first place is to go to books that they felt in the 20th century were written by Confucius or at least could be seen as going back to the words of Confucius. I'm thinking of the Huynh. Analects. And there's the famous quotation, yeah. the master did not speak of strange things, power, not quite clear what it means, chaos, not clear what it means, and shun, which could be anything, divine beings, ancestors, and so on. And then they would say, he didn't talk about religion. The quotation itself is completely unclear, there's no explanation. And with the Lunyu, you cannot be sure it goes back to the Confucius. In fact, we know 100% certain of a number of quotations, they do not go back to Confucius or his pupils because they were put in only in the Han dynasty, somewhere between, let's say, 202 and before Christ and then after Christ. They are very late editions. So something in the Lunyu is not necessarily by Confucius. It is believed to be by Confucius from, let's say, the first century. BCE onwards, very late, for example, it's later than he lived. So I'm already sort of yeah, showing that Confucius may not have been influential for 2,500 years. Sorry. So this quotation is of no use, and there are other quotations in which it's completely evident that Confucius or whoever is writing in his name or speaking and then writing down in his name did care about religion. Yeah, so you cannot claim that he did not think about religion, but neither can you know what you really thought about what he, or what they at the time thought was religious culture. The religion is no help to redefining the terminology. So I, and then I'm not very interested in finding new definitions of the term, I always want to find, yeah, what does the term come from, especially since I was already becoming a bit suspicious about the age of the term. And when I started Chinese studies in 1976, I thought Confucianism was an acceptable word. Uh, Last year I discovered the term was certainly not invented by the Jesuits, it was not even invented in the 18th century, probably invented in the 19th century. That's not an argument to start redefining a term. I mean, that means that first we make clear what the history of the term is. But before that, 
little digression. Another topic that has never been solved. So the term, the history of the term Confucianism or its Chinese pendant group is totally unclear. But also we know very little of the religious world of literati. There is a dogma that Chinese literati were secular. And you will write endless numbers of read endless numbers of books on Chinese literati who are Confucian and are supposed to be secular and if they have something religious with Buddhism. Can ignore it nothing to do with us, or now with it, that's worse. Uh, and you'll have a very famous literati who are described as secular, Li Gong is one of them. Li Gong is famous because he is an early 18th century, let's say, Confucian, but he is also famous because he tried to revive ritual. In fact, he tried to revive ritual to the extent that he learned to shoot with bow and arrow. Because in the Hunyu, in Confucius, what he called by the words of Confucius, that Confucius takes shooting with bow and arrow, there is other martial pursuits very seriously. So I thought that if I'm a true Confucian, I have to learn to shoot with bow and arrow. So I thought, okay, this is someone, whatever Ru means, whatever Confucianism means, Li Gu, 1650 to 1733, so really early 18th century, he is someone whom I can take as a representative example of the extreme of, let's say, whatever it means, Confucianism. Right? If he isn't religious, maybe that's interesting, but if he's religious, and I'll argue that he is, then yeah, if even, let's say, the extreme Confucianism is religious, then obviously yeah, Confucians are very likely most of the time religious. The problem is we just don't know much about the religious work of it, but it's not studied because they are a priori, a priori, a priori, secular, therefore we don't investigate the question what their religious life could have been like. Now, Li Gung actually practiced a lot of rituals. He practiced ancestor worship, he practices the worship of all kinds of nature gods, he does the usual fine crackers at the beginning of Chinese New Year, uh, and so on and so forth. There is a, he practices something called uh, letters of merit and demerit, which in origin is a Taoist custom, reintroduced in Chinese culture in the 16th century by a Buddhist Trukum, and then sort of widely practiced by, let's say, literati people who can read and write, in order to manage their inner moral life. Because it is a list on the one hand of good and on the other hand of bad deeds, and then you can register how many good deeds have to practice and how many bad deeds, and you can calculate, literally, because for each deed you get positive points, good, and negative points, good. And you can calculate how many good deeds you have done. In the end, you'll have good days and bad days. And if you're lucky, you'll get a sum. That's the option. Well, that's one of the rewards. Not girls, but sons. So, uh, so that's the kind of thing that Li Gu did. Li Gu did a lot of stuff that we would normally label as religious. He did it, of course, because he didn't have that word available to him. So I see no other reason to think that there would have been any non-religious confusions in the first place. But this is a topic for study. We need far more field work or work on what these literati have as a religious culture, a way of life. So I started to look at some primary sources, which is very easy nowadays. First thing is in the Western language, much easier for me than Chinese, obviously. Uh, and I look at online resources, that's also now in search of things. You just sit in your room and you can do it in the train. You download it and you start looking at it. You don't even need to read it. You just search for words like religion and so on. I look at that in the field two years and may not be so long, etc., etc., etc. What these are, uh, these are the edited letters by the Jesuits from China in the 18th century, sent back to Europe, Paris, actually, where it is collected in Paris and then edited, of course, and then published in order to propagate, that's where the word comes from, uh, propagate the faith, and the, the work of the mysteries in China to get funding for it, support for it, political support as well. And these letters are an important source of knowledge for 18th and early 19th century Westerners on China. In those days, educated Westerners still knew their language, which means Latin, in French, perhaps even German, and they would read this stuff before you know what was happening. People like Leibniz and so on. Nowhere in this 
roughly, I think, if in, in printing of those days it would be this much book from right here to this hand, this much book, quite a lot of pages. Nowhere is there any mention of Confucianism, Confucianism in French, of course. And I tried Confucius, different spellings, of course. It's not there. Yeah, they just don't use the word. They do reiterate the interested view that Chinese literati are secular, yeah, and they have a reason for that. Chinese literati have to be secular, that is, their ancestor worship has to be denied a religious dimension because otherwise the Jesuits would have to oppose ancestor worship, or literati would not become Christians. One of the big problems of the Jesuit approach was that they discovered that literati in China, whatever happened, wanted to maintain ancestor worship and respect of their ancestors. Therefore, since obviously to us and to the Dominican Franciscans of the time, ancestors would be spiritual beings, therefore deities, therefore worshiping them would be polytheism. We can't have polytheism and become Christian. We can have saints, we can have Christ, Mary, but you can't have other, sorry, this is a Protestant speak. You can't have uh, other deities, ancestors. So what the Jesuits did was very Jesuitic, I would say. They redefined ancestors as just memory of ancestors. And this interpretation has become extremely dominant. You will still find it in China today because it enables people to maintain ancestor worship while not being religious. And just commemoration. It's like a picture of your grandfather or of your children on your have so that's what they did. They defined ancestor worship and the worship of Confucius away as just commemorating, not really reflecting the way it worked, but that's what they did. And, but they don't use the term Confucianism, hence it doesn't exist yet. I mean, if you don't even have the word, I would say. The first guy who ever used the word, although he misspelled it, is a guy called John Barrow. In the point PowerPoint we first used it. Uh, Tom Barrow was a teacher of the son of the Stanton. Stanton, okay, George Stanton is one of the assistants of McCartney on his embassy in China in 1792 and 1794. From the south of Peking and eventually next year back again. He was the son, son's teacher, and as a result, he got invited on the expedition. And on the expedition, both John Barrow and the son, who was, I think, nine or so, very young, learned Chinese. Not extremely well, but they learned Chinese. I'm very suspicious about how much, because when you read his book, you see that he actually barely has information based on talking to people. And most of his information is based on reading, and they have interpreters. But the interpreters never mentioned, but we know they have. But whatever the quality of his knowledge, he was in China. He was one of the first people who was in China for many months, and not just in Canton, but in China proper. At Peking, and for many months on the way to Peking, and then back again. He traveled around in northern China. We know that as well. Um, and he wrote a book. And whether his knowledge was good or not doesn't really matter. He wrote one of the most influential books on China for a European audience of the 19th century. He published it in 1804, it's called Travels in China, and downloaded it on the web. It was reprinted, it was translated in a number of European languages. It was a very influential book, and in many ways our knowledge, 19th century knowledge on China, actually comes from this book. It's not always acknowledged, but when you look at the kind of things people say on various topics, also negative stuff, it, it tends to coincide over that very well with what John Barrow said. Now John Barrow explicitly opposes the Jesuit view of literati as what he calls atheists. He stresses that they have a thoroughly religious culture. It doesn't matter whether he's right or not. That's what he says. To him they are religious and he has met literati. They are the one group of people that would have had extended conversations with through an interpreter in the Yuan in the summer palace. Not the modern summer palace, but the one that the British burned down in 1860. Yes. Um, he explicitly uses the term Confucianists. So not Confucianists, but Confucianists. But otherwise he uses the term three times. And he speaks of the religion of Confucius. 
very briefly, he believes, he feels that they believe in an animated universe, a universe in which everything hangs together, in which you have gods, in which you have powers of nature, and so on. He establishes, I think it's probably right, that there is a whole lot of worship of various, what do you say, supernatural beings, and is inspired by the writers of Confucius. Now here I have to digress. What are writers of Confucius? To the modern specialists, the best you'll get is maybe the Buyu, the Analects, as the writers of Confucius. Now that's, even that's not the writers of Confucius, but something made up later that may or may not, probably not, go back to this time and age, but that's the modern view. Yeah, at best the Buyu, the Analects. But until the early 20th century, all the five classics, yeah, all the five classics, plus the six, which is lost, and the classic of music, were ascribed by Confucius. The writings of Confucius were far broader, wider, and included the book of doctrines, obviously, the book of poetry, or odes, the book of ritual, the spring and autumn, and the book of changes. And then there was always talk of a book that was lost, the book of music, never existed. But that's another topic. Um, so, this stuff, these books, were indeed the basis of what late imperial intellectual Chinese thought was ancient ritual culture. And there is a whole lot of engagement with it. And major intellectual figures from the 17th, maybe 16th century onwards, who we would call Confucian or Wu, yeah, engaged themselves with these classical texts in order to reconstruct what they thought was ancient Chinese religion. So when Barrow, John Barrow speaks about worship inspired by the writings of Confucius, he's not speaking about the learning, he's speaking about all of these classical texts. And that certainly it makes much more sense what he is saying. Because that's what the rule of the Tiao is. Not the Lunyu, but all of these texts. And he points out the first state cults, the worship of Confucius, ancestor worship, all go back to these texts. Of course, it's much more complicated from a historical point of view, but that's how he sees it. The next important writer is a guy called Joseph Atkins, British as well. Much more important than James Lager. Now, Joseph Atkins, born 1823, died in 1905, spent most of his life in China, from 1848 onwards. And no doubt he stayed a foreigner in a foreign community, but the foreign community in those days was very, very small, tens of people. It's not like when our students go to Peking and basically they can survive for an entire year without speaking to Chinese. And I'm pretty sure some of them actually do, given the state of their Chinese when they go back. It's very easy nowadays, like for Chinese here. Maybe that's more how to now, that's true. Gets closer to you. Uh, how many Chinese here really have Western friends? A few, clearly, but not many. Yeah? You, you interact with Chinese. And so most Westerners in those days in China were the same. They interacted with other Westerners. But Atkins is explicitly described as reading Chinese books all day long, already in the 1950s, very in the 1850s, very soon. He describes how he meets Chinese intellectuals, Chinese Buddhist priests, and talks to them. It doesn't mean he becomes a Chinese, probably. Yeah, but he is thoroughly acquainted with Chinese points of view. And he is not always negative about it, a lot. Obviously, he is a Christian, he is a missionary. He cannot embrace Buddhism entirely, but he takes it quite seriously. Taoism he does not take seriously, but Buddhism, whatever, stuff done by Buddhist priests and monks, and stuff done by the Tibetan, he takes very seriously. He's also one of the first linguists trying to have a theory of where the Chinese language comes from. It's he is wrong. doesn't matter. He is seriously engaged with the question where the language comes from. The fact that it's wrong is not so relevant. It's not really fair. And he writes already in 1859, but much later than Tom Barrow's book, called The Religious Condition of the Chinese. It's a rare book. So most people who study him use later versions of the book, but the oldest version is from 1859. And he calls Confucianism a religion. And he thinks that things like the shrine for noble virtuous women, the altar for agriculture, the shenu, right? uh, ancestor worship and filial piety worship of Confucius are all Confucian religion. That's how he defines it. Not very different from Tom Barrett. 
frankly. And I would be, I would not be surprised that that, that, book, that he has read that book, but I don't know for sure. He, I don't recall that he quotes it in a footnote. But it's very likely that before he went to China, in England as preparation, he would have read the Travis in China. James Legger, I already mentioned, lived roughly in China from 1840 to 1873, some visits back home, but basically 1840 to 1873, most of that time, almost 30 years, he spent in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong, really have to stress that Hong Kong is not your modern Hong Kong. Right? Hong Kong is really a small fishing village, and the foreigners all lived probably within 100 meters of each other. And they would have seen a lot of religious culture. Even now in Hong Kong, when you go out, outside of the city center, yeah, even on Hong Kong Island, you can see a lot of religious culture still going on, despite conscious and unconscious efforts by the British to deal with it, lessen it, let's say. And there's still a lot around. It's actually quite easy once you go outside of the city center to see religious culture. You just have to pick the right place of the year. So he will have seen it, but he was already in the 1840s translating his famous theory. Chinese classics, and if you are translating all time like us sitting here, you don't take part in life anymore. He was not really talking to Chinese a lot, except this one guy, Wang Chao, and a few others who helped him translate. But he also calls Confucianism the ancient religion of China. Basically, all the religious activities that can be legitimated in the classics, the five classics for the menu, were for him Confucianism. As you will start to discover, basically, they are making it up. Right? They are not saying there is something that the Chinese call Rukiao and that we therefore can translate as Confucianism. And they say, okay, there is stuff that my our Chinese informants say is based on text associated with Confucianism. And we now start to call that what, sorry, text associated with Confucius, right? And now we start to call that Confucianism. The really interesting guy is Justice Doolittle. If you want to read a really interesting book about social life of the Chinese, it's also the title of the book, 1865, read that book. It's online, you can just download it. So I do, when possible. It's a very good edition. Um, social life of the Chinese describes literally what the title says, all aspects of social life, literati, women, children, fortune tellers, also Christians, but that's more normative, in Fuzhou in the mid, midst of the 19th century. One place, and he actually describes how he goes with someone to visit a certain place. So you really know that he has been there. He's not just sitting in his study listening. Now this guy, despite his task, which he did for roughly 15 years, 1849, 1864, despite his task of spreading Christian beliefs, he went out into the field and he visited all these strange customs that he saw around him. He, he wanted to understand and he described it fairly matter of fact. It's only in his Christian chapters at the end of the book that he shows that in the end he is really a Western mystery who thinks that China would be much better off with Christianity, specifically his American version of it. And he calls, he speaks of something the priests of Confucianism, or the sect of the learned. It's very explicit. Confucianism is the religious culture of the educated layer of society. And he has a term, professors of ceremonies. Now, at first sight, and that's probably why it has been ignored by most people who study Confucianism, at first sight, professors of ceremonies sounds wrong. Because if you don't really live in China in the future, you will not encounter, would not have encountered them. You can no longer encounter them. They're gone. But we have found them, or at least not me. Uh, my colleagues have found them. People who did really deep level field work in the southwest of Fujian, as well as in Hubei, Hunan, in local exorcist ritual theater. These people have found that in both in the southwest of Fujian and in Hubei, Hunan, you had the Shun professors of ceremony. And they perform they perform a role in advising on ritual activities. They advise to do these ritual activities in a way that is actually much more what we would call Confucian, yeah. literati, state cult, than Taoist or Buddhist. 
and they actually do have a very specific approach that we can recognize. Yeah? If you want, have some openness here, but that we can recognize as more Confucian than certainly Buddhist or Taoist. It's a separate ritual tradition that's there. And do it to saw it. But because nobody would see it unless they would really do, they would immerse themselves in local Chinese society. Most of our colleagues, whether Chinese or Tibetan, whether Chinese, modern Chinese, or us, me, yeah, we wouldn't see it. And you really have to live on a local village level in order to get to know these people. It's not immediately obvious. And he says, and I think this applies to all of the predecessors as well. Confucianism consists of the religious, moral, and philosophical tenets and doctrines which are to be found in the Chinese classics, the writings of the sages, and the words of antiquity. It numbers amongst its adherents and followers all the learned men of the country. But at the same time, it only says it's not state religious, so that's different from the others. So he has a definition, but he's also struggling. Now, the most, the weirdest definition from a modern perspective is the one by G.G. and the Grote in the religion of China. Most of you will not have heard of that book. You will have heard of the religious system of China or um, of his book on, um, oh, well, you may not have heard of it. Who reads French here? Nobody, see? Oh, a few. Les fêtes annuellement célébrées à Eoui. So he has a book, it's all either in French or in Dutch, the Feesten and Gebruiken, but nobody here knows Dutch, I'm afraid, so it's not in English. But it's one of the best books on local religious festivals in traditional China, which is basically his dissertation. A very famous book in Europe, at least, among people who study local Chinese religious culture. I mean, you have to learn French to do it, it's just impossible without it. Um, but most people don't, don't know this book because of the next quotation, I would say, and the way he elaborates it. The state religion, accordingly, may be called classicism. It may be called Confucianism, Universalism, or Taoism. It may be called canonical and orthodox. For, since there is only one Tao, Tao, or order of the world, and one set of Bibles or classics promulgating and maintaining the Tao among men, all other religions must naturally be inconsistent with the universe itself, and consequently dangerous for the government and the human race. So he sees what we, or he calls Taoism, but if it's the same as what we call Taoism, it's another matter. But what he calls Taoism and Confucianism, he calls one and the same thing. He identifies it as classicism, it's a common term for Confucianism nowadays, and he identifies it with state religion. Now we usually misunderstand this quotation as saying that what we today call Taoism is what he thinks is the same as Confucianism, but what he calls Taoism is something very different. A better translation would have been universalism. It's because this word Tao appears in all Chinese religious traditions. So it's not modern Taoism, but it's his way of referring to the general religion. In German, he calls it Universalismus, so the universal religion of Chinese, and he calls that Taoism. But this quotation, and all the rest that he says in this book, and the German version of it, has been misunderstood. So, we have, he's even been called a missionary. Well, if there's one thing he hated, it's missionaries. If there's one other thing he hated, probably before that, it was Roman Catholicism. So he was born Roman Catholic himself. He left the church at 18, which in the 19th century was a very rare thing to do. And he left the church at 18 because his family's priest, wanted to uh, try to influence his mother in forbidding the marriage of his sister to a Protestant. It's Dutch culture. And we have different religions living next to each other, and the priests of the various cult, uh, religious traditions try to prevent interaction. And he hated that, and so he left the Roman Catholic Church for that reason. So whatever he is, he's not a missionary. And he studies, that makes him so special, he studies Chinese in order to understand Chinese religion. Yeah, also very rare. So not to spread Christianity. He never tried to do that. He doesn't study Chinese because he wants a job. Because studying Chinese in Leiden meant you get a scholarship. Yeah, and you work for five years in the Dutch Indies and then you have to sort of pay back your scholarship. That's although he gets the scholarship, it's not the reason. He wants to understand Chinese religion. That's what he devotes his life to. Now what else does he call 
Confucianism, state codes basically. All state codes from the central level down to local codes recognized by the state for their moral value. The Quan Di, Emperor Quan, because he represents loyalty and righteousness, would be a Confucian cult. So basically, the fork identifies Confucianism with state, state sponsored religion. And he excludes ancestor worship. It's a long list. The main thing to remember is they tend to identify Confucianism with religious practices, or ritual worshipping practices, if you don't like the word religion, that are identified by Chinese literati as stemming from the classics, the five classics, in one way or another. Yeah, so not the Renu, not the Analex, but the five classics. And I think in many ways they're right. Right. Whether you want to like the label of Christianism or not, but, but it makes sense. That's what people, intellectuals at the time did. They had a number of practices which to these literati, slash state officials, was very important, uh, which went back, according to them, not correct, but according to them, went back to texts that were edited, transmitted, maybe even written by Confucius. So to call that Confucianism was not a bad idea. Except Barrow and Lego. These people that I've been mentioned, talking about, had extensive knowledge of China. I'll get back to that. They had extensive knowledge of the Chinese language. Not to be forgotten either. I mean, there are only too many people write about China and have no knowledge of Chinese language. They were missionaries or state officials. Only one of them was trained as a sinologist at home. One of them, the both. Yeah, he went to Leibniz in the, I think in the 1860s, and he learned classical Chinese vernacular, written vernacular Chinese, some dialect, and he got some training in China look like. And he hated his teacher, because probably the girl was a homosexual, was a homosexual, and his teacher was extremely macho. He even wrote an article about his visit to the flower boats, basically Amsterdam red light district in Stam. So very different. All of them had been trained before the advent of modern academic standards. We often forget that, that Oxford, Leiden, and so on, all of these famous universities, until the late, until the late 19th century, practiced scholarship in a very different way from what we do today. That modern scholarship footnotes, uh, taking the secondary literature seriously, taking your problems of objectivity and subjectivity. Seriously, that is a late 19th century phenomenon. It's not an old phenomenon. And although we may be one university going back to the 13th century, not Queens, but other parts of this university, going back to the 13th century, nonetheless, yeah, the way in which they practice this study of other colors and so on is very different. James Legge is still very much representative of the old style. You translate, you don't reflect very much. And then something changes. You get I think that this will be for people who know more about philosophy. You get a different way of looking at philosophy, because more secular, no longer a system to theology or religion. You get a new type of Chinese studies in Europe. I can't do too much detail of it. But the new style of Chinese studies in Europe, we speak in very late 19th and mostly early 20th century, is dominated by people in Europe without field experience. The new generations of people who study China usually have not been to China. The French sinologists have very little, and that goes back to the 18th century, have very little field knowledge of China. Chavan is the most prominent French sinologist around 1900, has only been to China for a few months at the time. He's done field trips, but not field work. What he did was very good in a early 20th century way, but he never lived in China with Chinese. And even a lot of the German sinologists have never ever been to China, or only late in their career. They were trained in Greek and Latin. And so they were trained as classicists, which means that for them, the definition of old culture is the text, right? not the possibility that this text functions in a larger living religious context. Very strong classical training, and they were very much focused on the very few texts that they had available, mostly German. That's relevant again, not to say anything negative about the Germans, because this is where modern academic scholarship comes from, late 19th, 20th century Germany. 
but it was a scholarship that was focused on texts. And there was no room for field knowledge. There was an incredible distrust of mysteries, of diplomats, of people who had been in China with an other type of interest. Because they thought they were doing, had this new type of scholarship, thought they were objective. They were moving from texts. And the mysteries obviously were not objective. They wanted to spread Christian faith. And the diplomats, the Grote in the end, was an interpreter in the Dutch colonial government in the Dutch Indies. They were not objective either. Probably the most pernicious thing of those days was, and that is just personal, was there was this guy, the Vogt, he left Leiden in 1912 because he opposed fraternities. To put it very simply, he opposed, he was right, but he opposed fraternities in the time that you shouldn't oppose fraternities. The fraternities hated him and made a fool of him in their uh, zero year and their fresher play and so on. So they more or less got rid of him, he fled Leiden, he left for Berlin, he get the First World War, he is on the German, on the Kaiser side of things, and so he gets uh, despised by the French, by the Dutch, he's totally out of place, he actually loses his pension, not before the war, but because he leaves for Germany in the first place, and in Germany, they also don't like him, there must have been personality issues, or it's his sexual background, I don't know, but they don't like him. So everything that the Groot stands for is sort of negated. On the one hand, he's criticized because he sees one single religious culture in China. He's, we now think that he's probably more right than his critics. But in those days, that was just unthinkable. There could only be the elite Confucian culture or no religion and so on and so forth. He was criticized for seeing the dominant religious culture. China as a religious system, and he was criticized because he did not believe that Confucius had invented China, the Lunyu, and that kind of thing, because he was criticized for not reading the Lunyu as the basis of Chinese culture. The new way of thinking, both in Holland and in Germany, and they were very dominant in early 19th, 20th century study of China, the new way of thinking was to start from the early texts. And that way of thinking was, in, was supported by this classical training of the early 20th century Samologists in Germany, also in Holland, but it's less conspicuous. I mean, they all learned Greek and Latin before they went to university, but especially in Germany. And it is supported by a new phenomenon in China, the May 4th movement, what we still call, maybe not for long, but what we still call the May 4th movement, and the rejection of all kinds of the association of Confucianism with whatever is bad in Chinese culture and an attempt to go back to the original meaning of these texts. Even those people who did live in China, most of them didn't, but one guy did, the most influential Dutch Sinologist before the Second World War, Duivendag. Um, he lived in China, but he lived in China in a very isolated spot in the uh, diplomatic quarters of Peking. If you ever go to, everybody here goes to Peking all the time. So if you go to the Forbidden City, stand for if you look at the Forbidden City, on your right hand side you have the old station, still there, Beijing. And then behind it you have the legation quarter. You have nice old western buildings. I think they're nice. Old western buildings, that's where, that's the restored yeah, diplomatic quarter after the Boxer Rebellion. That's where Daffodak worked. He lived there for six or seven years. He did know Chinese, the language, as well as people. He was more or less pals with Zhang Xun, one of the last guy who tried to restore the imperial system. He went around taking pictures of uh, food, of famine control, and so on, but he did not study Chinese culture on a ground level. And he looked at it from outside in the end. And he rejected, and he had to reject all of these interpretations by his own teacher, the Groot, because the Groot had been attacked in Holland for not taking this new mantis and so on seriously. So it was more or less not possible anymore to take the interpretation of the Groot seriously. So as a result of all of these developments, seeing Confucianism as a religious culture was simply left behind. It was no longer a done thing to do. Now, I could go on endlessly. There's still a lot I don't understand. As I said, this is not the project I wanted to do. 
It's just a sideline. I was asked to give a paper actually on how early synodalities look at China. I then looked at some English people, how they looked at Chinese religious culture. I discovered that they actually invented the term Confucianism, and that sort of opened the box of Pandora. Because it turned out that once I started to look up definitions of Confucianism, nobody defines it properly. I thought definitions of philosophy would be nice, nobody defines it, and so on and so forth. So suddenly you are walking on quicksand. It's all very shaky. But what is clear, the word Confucianism is a very late 19th century invention. It's inspired by Wu Jiao, but not the same. It's a Western way of interpreting Wu Jiao and what you see around you as living religious culture in the 19th century. Confucianism as a philosophy, I mean here secular philosophy, independent of religion or theology, is an even later, probably 20th century invention. The restriction is Confucianism as a religion assumes that the number of religious activities are based on the classics, yeah? broadly defined and associated with Confucius. Confucianism as a philosophy limits itself to writings that are ascribed to Confucius, basically the Lui, the Analex, not the commentaries, just the Analex as the original works of Confucius, the writ of all commentaries that exist. Then who is right? Nobody is right, because it's an invention anyhow. So you can do what you want. The thing is not what, that you, therefore, whether you're right or not, as long as you make clear what you're doing. Yeah, are you talking about Confucianism claiming that what you're studying is something that has always been there, then you would be wrong. If you make clear that you are basically using texts described by Confucius for the present, philosophize with it, that's fine. So it depends on your perspective whether for me you would be right or not. But it is ironic that the missionaries whom we tend to, who I used to despise, quite emotional, yeah, they destroyed the stuff that I study, that these missionaries who are definitely orientalists, who are definitely prejudiced and so on, they saw more. Yeah, because they lived in a culture where all of the things that we study, so-called popular religion, literary religion, is almost still alive, still there. And they saw it, they may not have seen everything, but they saw a lot. And interestingly, because they were not pals with the Torah, they saw it in a way, in a way that was not too, too much influenced by Chinese intellectuals. I don't know, sorry for that, I don't like Chinese intellectuals very much. It's good you don't know my uh, why don't I like Chinese intellectuals? Because they tend to look down on their own culture. Yeah, I don't agree with that, so I have a problem with Chinese intellectuals. So if the Chinese intellectuals here don't look down on their culture, then it's fine. But these missionaries, yeah, they didn't engage much with the Tibet because the Tibet is just often very funny. They engage with local people. Clever people, stupid people, all kinds of local people, but not the Tibet. So they saw a much bigger China than the literati or us. The next generation, so the Duivendaks of this lot, early 20th century, they were much more in keeping with indigenous views. And the way they looked at China was the way in which literati looked at China. They were, in a way, less orientalist, right? less influenced by Western perspective. They didn't want the Chinese to become Christian necessarily. They might be Christian themselves, but they didn't want to spread the faith. On the other hand, they were less and less based on local experience. So they may have been less orientalist, but they got more and more divorced from the realities of Chinese religious life. And this, after the 1930s, became even worse, yeah, because the religious context within which state cults, cult of Confucius ancestry, cult of that's one function, the stuff they, like I said, the default Confucianism as a religious culture, that culture is lost. We can no longer see the whole. We can only see the remnants, if we want to. And there's only one exception among scholars of, let's say, Neo-Confucianism, inspired by Zhu Xi and so on, and there's a guy called Rodney Taylor. And his career, in many ways, illustrates my point. Because why does Rodney Taylor see the religious dimension of Confucianism? Of course, because, you might say, because he studies late Ming, late 16th, early 17th century, 
Neo Confucius, Wang Yangming, adepts who practice uh, meditation and so on. You could say, okay, it's because his people are more religious. There's another reason. He studied in Japan, in Fukuoka. He studied in, in uh, Japan, in Fukuoka, at Kyushu Daiyaku, the University of Kyushu, where you have a guy, you had, he's going that now, Okada Takehiko, his teacher. And his teacher actually still practiced, let's say, Wu Jiao as a living thing, as something that was not just a text that he studies, but something that shaped his daily life. He would still worship incense for books. He would arrange his whole study in what he thought was a Confucian way. So this is what he did. Like he studied this someone to whom Confucianism was still a living organic thing in Japan. Because, of course, Confucianism is not just something, whatever it is. And that's from, from China, it's a thing that went to Korea and went to Japan and stayed in a life in Japan for a very long time. That's it.